Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. It's Wednesday, January 26th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. Half of Americans hold just 2% of the nation's wealth. St. Louis Public Radio is taking the next year to share stories about how the wealth-poverty gap is impacting our region. Wealth, simply put, allows you the freedom to do a variety of things. It allows you to not have to live paycheck to paycheck. St. Louis Public Radio's Corinne Ruff walks us through what wealth inequality means in just a few minutes. The St. Louis County Police Department has its first black chief. The Board of Police Commissioners is giving acting chief Kenneth Gregory the job permanently. St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Lippman reports. Gregory joined the department in 1979 and spent much of his early career in North St. Louis County. Before he was promoted to acting chief in July, after the retirement of Mary Barton, he was commander of the patrol division, the department's largest. Gregory thanked the commissioners for their support during his six months as acting chief. He says he never thought his career would lead him here. 42 years ago, no one would have given this department a look at to see that, you know, a man that looks like me would be chief. Due to coronavirus restrictions, the police commissioner's meeting was streamed online. The department's union said in a statement it looks forward to working with Gregory to make St. Louis County, quote, the best place to work in law enforcement. I'm Rachel Lippman. St. Louis Public Radio. Loop trolley leaders have an extra month to come up with a plan to get the system running once again. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones says federal authorities have approved an extension from February 1st to March 1st. It's been no secret that this is something that uh, I didn't support uh, from the beginning. However, uh, it landed in my lap as mayor and I'm committed to fixing it because St. Louis City and St. Louis County do not have $22 million to give back to the federal government. The trolley has not been in service since December 2019 and even when it was running, it wasn't making as many trips as originally promised. That means the project could be violating terms of the federal grants funding it. Leaders could be forced to repay millions of dollars if they don't approve a restart by the new March 1st deadline. Federal transportation officials want the trolley back in service this summer. More than 40 doctors and nurses from the U.S. Navy arrive at Christian Hospital in North St. Louis County today to help doctors overwhelmed by the influx of COVID-19 patients. As St. Louis Public Radio's Chad Davis reports, hospital officials say military personnel will help ease a stressed health care system. The Navy personnel are responding to a request by the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force for federal help at 11 hospitals in the St. Louis region. Their arrival follows an unprecedented rise in coronavirus cases due to the Omicron variant. Rick Stevens is president of Christian Hospital. He says 100 of its doctors, nurses, and workers were out last week because they were ill. Stevens says staff shortages and the influx of COVID patients have limited the hospital's ability to treat all of those in its care. When you just get to the point of where the system is just overloaded, you can't see everyone in the timely manner that they would like uh, to see individuals. The Navy personnel are expected to stay at the hospital for about a month. I'm Chad Davis, St. Louis Public Radio. A Missouri Senate committee is advancing two congressional redistricting maps after hearing testimony yesterday on the proposals. St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Kellogg reports. While the maps passed would likely send six Republicans and two Democrats to Congress, senators listened to hours of testimony from supporters of a 7-1 redistricting map, which would reduce Missouri's Democratic seats to one. One argument for a 7-1 map came from anti-abortion rights activists who want to elect as many representatives as they can who align with their beliefs. Democratic Senator Brian Williams pushed back against using policy as a basis for redistricting. All I'm asking is that can we get back to focusing on what the, the scope of redistricting is? The maps will now head to the Senate floor where a long debate is expected. In Jefferson City, I'm Sarah Kellogg, St. Louis Public Radio. The gap between people with a lot of money and those struggling to pay bills is at historic levels. Wealth inequality is particularly glaring between black and brown communities and white ones. St. Louis Public Radio 
is taking the next year to unpack how the wealth poverty gap impacts our region. Corinne Ruff kicks off the series with a guide to understanding wealth inequality. The first thing to understand about wealth inequality is wealth. So what is it? A simple equation can help out here. First, count up any saved income, meaning cash, savings, and investments. Then add assets, things like a house, a 401k, or an inheritance. Now subtract debt. Think student loans or credit card payments. That final number you get equals wealth. Wealth, simply put, allows you the freedom to do a variety of things. This is Bill Rogers. He's the director of the Institute for Economic Equity at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and he's collecting local wealth data. It allows you to not have to live paycheck to paycheck. It allows you the ability to respond to emergencies. This is where wealth inequality comes into play, because half of Americans hold just 2% of all the nation's wealth. That's big. But the racial wealth gap? It's enormous. Data from the Fed show that last year, white families on average had about a million dollars more in wealth than black and Hispanic families. This unequal distribution of wealth, well, that affects all aspects of daily life, including education, housing, and health care. We spoke with experts across those areas to better understand the connections. Let's start with education. It's often thought of as the way to pull a person out of poverty. But Charlie Cooksey, the CEO of local nonprofit WePower, says a college degree isn't a ticket to the middle class. For one thing, black students take on way more debt. It just almost feels counterproductive to pursue an education that someone should have a right to and then have to pay a literal economic cost. In fact, just a few years out of college, the Brookings Institute says black graduates have nearly $25,000 more debt than white graduates. Cooksey says people often oversimplify the solution to wealth inequality by focusing on how individuals can educate themselves. The problem with that mindset is that It puts the onus on black folks to solve a multi-hundred-year-old problem by them simply getting access to financial literacy when financial illiteracy is not what created the racial wealth divide. Now, let's shift to housing. Buying a house is the biggest way Americans build wealth. But you need wealth to buy a house. Yung Chun, a housing expert with Washington University's Social Policy Institute, says once you have wealth, it's a lot easier to build more. And the largest portion of individual asset is property. So in this sense, I view that the wealth and property gap issue is systemic. So when he says systemic, he's talking about old policies like redlining, which kept people of color from buying homes. And that meant fewer people were able to inherit a home. What does that look like in our region? Well, Fed data show more than 80 percent of white people in St. Louis County own a home. Less than half of black people do. Chun says it's time to let go of the idea that talent plays a big role in gaining wealth. Many people believe the American dream tend to stick to this belief. That is, in the land of opportunity, people can achieve anything that they can if they do their best. Finally, let's talk about health care. Wealth inequality is also a major driver of health disparities in the St. Louis region. Alan Freeman knows a lot about this. He's the CEO of Affinia Healthcare, which serves the largest number of the area's uninsured and low-income residents, many of whom are Black. Addressing these social and economic factors, this wealth gap, this inequality that exists, is important in tackling the differences in health that exist. And where you live in St. Louis is a powerful indicator. Black and brown communities are more likely to suffer chronic disease, problems at birth, and injury from violence. So we've talked about education, housing, and health care. But to really get a handle on wealth inequality, Fed economist Bill Rogers wants people to think about what they'd do if they got an unexpected $400 bill. He says, ask yourself, what would paying it look like at different life stages, say, as a new parent or during retirement? And then hopefully that will further open people's eyes around why having the strong ability for everybody in the community to generate wealth. Yes, it helps those individual families, but most importantly, it helps the community become resilient. Because when everyone can weather a downturn, like a pandemic, we're all better off. 
I'm Corinne Ruff, St. Louis Public Radio. Our Maria Altman edited that report. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. This has been The Gateway. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.